fear is so destructive, why it, it fuels the enemies of God, which are the demons, Satan and his minions, because they feast on fear. When we trust the word of God, the promises of God, we overcome all of these trials. We overcome fear. We need more compassion, not condemnation. No word should cause you to fear. We must be walking in boldness. That's what God's word says. Welcome, my family. Randy Kay here. A while ago, I was speaking with somebody who is gifted in the prophetic and uh, another person also gifted who is writing many of our teaching materials for my family, our virtual church. And her name is Paula Langhoff. She also is an afterlife survivor. And uh, they were uh, receiving dreams and visions about a message and spiritual warfare and how what's going on today is adding uh, kind of fuel to the fire, if you will, and that it's giving uh, credence to the enemy and allowing the enemy to have his, his way far too often and why that is. And they said, you know, I, th I think uh, this is what they told me. I think that uh, the Lord wants you to talk about this. Well, I, I really wasn't prepared to talk about the subject that I'm going to be talking with you about until much prayer and uh, discernment uh, that I went through to prepare for this message. Because what I'm going to be talking about is the fact that we are hearing a lot of conspiracy theories we're hearing a lot of fear propagated, uh, and I'm talking about within the Christian community. We're, uh, we're hearing a lot of prophetic doomsday sayers, if you will, and those who are really adding to a negative narrative in terms of our victory through Christ, that is that uh, the enemy will prevail in some regard, and of course we know from the book of Revelation, from things that I've shared with you, that obviously, uh, there are the end times and tribulation and things of that sort that are clearly described within the Bible, and we've talked a lot about them. But it's not to depress anyone. It's not to discourage anyone. In fact, uh, when I talk about matters of the end times, I'm talking about the ultimate outcome, which is the redemption of humankind through Christ and the victory that God has. But we're hearing a lot of uh, people in the public domain have given they're given license on uh, in podcasts and other other means of conveying a message that is very dark uh, that is talking about things that will happen about uh, negative that is outcomes and of course the election of 2024 and if this doesn't happen then uh, then this will happen that is of a of a very defeatist. Uh, uh, mentality that is conveyed uh, but of course we know that we have the victory through Christ and even though uh, some of us may talk about end times things there should be no narrative that would depress you that would discourage you that would cause you to feel that uh, you just want to escape you just want to get out of here because you have a purpose today each of us does of course and that purpose is very, very important. As I've talked about before, as a witness uh, in heaven, there is a void that is comprised of lost purposes, that is purposes unfulfilled, lost dreams, those who have given up and just kind of given over their purpose, which is singular to, to you and me, that is that no one can do what God has ordained for you. If you don't do it, then it doesn't get done. It goes into that void in heaven. So encouragement is very important in this day and age. We hear a lot of criticism, especially within the Christian community of each other, one another. 
And of course, you know, correction is, is good if it's truly done in the spirit of love. But if it's done really uh, to kind of elevate oneself above another, that is, I know better than someone else, then that self-edification that's building oneself up is not building up the body of Christ, which is the entire purpose of the gifts of uh, of uh, the Spirit, Holy Spirit, and of course the gift of prophecy. It's edification. That means building up the body of Christ. But it's also uh, helping others to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. There's only one uh, spiritual gift, by the way, that does not edify, that is build up the body of Christ. All of the other spiritual gifts, the gifts of prophecy, teaching, uh, healing, of hospitality, uh, the gift of helps. All of the spiritual gifts are intended to build up the body of Christ, but there's one spiritual gift that is intended for those who are not in the body of Christ. And uh, I'm gonna ask you if you know what that one is, uh, because uh, there, there are many who are gifted with that, and perhaps you are, and the one gift is the gift of evangelism. You see, the gift of evangelism is drawing people who do not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior to attract them through the prompting of the Holy Spirit to reveal the truth to them that they might be set free and thereby released into a newness of life through the power, saving power of Jesus Christ. But what's happening today and it's happening in the spiritual realm by virtue of what is happening in many circles today in the public domain is a defeating of evangelism. That is a discouragement, not only within the body of Christ, but evangelism. That is others are looking in and saying, you know, these Christians are really <laughs> attacking each other or that, you know, they're really negative. They're really not speaking in a way that is attractive to me. That is the non-believer. And therefore, I don't want to have anything to do with it. You know, it was Mahatma Gandhi, of all people, not a Christian. But he said, you know, I love your Christ. I just don't like your Christians. So today we're seeing a phenomena, uh, sadly enough, where there are many who are spreading fear and, and uh, propagating uh, cowering uh, to a malaise, uh, and there are many who are prophesying and have, uh, false prophets, and there are many false prophets, by the way, certainly that's happening, but some of the false prophets are ironically prophesying against those they claim to be false prophets. So that's the irony of what's going on. There's kind of a uh, fighting in between uh, that that share of fighting or competing for that share of voice that uh, is in the public domain. And I think that's very sad because that's very fleshly. You know, God uh, should have uh, our voice, his voice, that is, in our life. And that should be the preeminent voice that he has. You know, scripture teaches us in Romans eight thirty seven, no, in all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. You know, that, that is the conquering nature of Jesus Christ is something we should focus on. That is that anything that would happen in this world will happen not to defeat us, but to ultimately save us. Salvation is, is what is in the cards for us, if you will. We are destined for heaven. If you know Christ Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you should not be depressed. Now, when I say that, I, I don't say that easily because uh, for much of my life, I suffered with uh, clinical depression. That was clinical and that there was a chemical imbalance within me. Um, it happened with my father, happened to a, uh, an extent with my son. And it's not a depression that uh, is just as uh, kind of a woe as me because, you know, it's uh, circumstantial by, based on a situation. So I had to get over that, uh, and I got through it through the power of Christ uh, to get over that, to think not in a defeatist way, but to think in a victorious way. And I'll tell you in a little bit, uh, a little while, 
what happens in the second heaven, the spiritual domain, what I perceived in heaven and some others as well, that showed how the negative propensity, the criticisms, the naysayers, the the doomsday sayers are actually feeding into the demonic influences that are happening in our world today, such that all of those things that are speaking oppression are actually providing fuel to the demons in the spiritual warfare that occurs in the second heaven where the angels are battling. And I'll talk about some of the characteristics of what, what happens that causes either the angels to gain the victory in spiritual warfare or the demons to gain the victory in spiritual warfare. You see, when I died, I rose from the hospital room. I could see my body on the bed and uh, I was rising from the pole of the light of Jesus Christ. But as I rose, I was going through these various places. The first heavens, they're heavens plural in the Bible, as you may know. The first heaven are the galaxies, our earth where we live. So I was being pulled through those places. And then the second heaven was the place of spiritual warfare. And I was there, I was in that place. And I was seeing the demons on the left side and I was seeing the angels on the right side and they were battling with one another. And I came to know after my experience what was going on because I entered into my after death uh, experience in a point of consternation. I won't get into the details, but I'll tell very uh, superficial, well, in a, in a very short way, that my daughter was having strokes. Um, we'd gone through a series of uh, financial uh, defeats, um, lost our, our uh, approval through the uh, FDA for a breakthrough drug for Alzheimer's. And a series of different things. Anyway, I was entering into a point of consternation, which meant that there was a spiritual battle going on. And I could literally see that in front of my eyes as I was released from my physical body. And now I was in my spiritual body and I was beholding this warfare going on. Well, I came to know that they were battling over the rights to my soul. You say the soul is not the spirit, the born again spirit. I was born again. The soul is the animating part of us that that translates what's going on around us as to whether uh, we have a positive or encouraging sense of something or whether we have a defeatist or a discouraging sense of something. That is, we can look at the not just the glass glass half full or glass empty, but what we can look at from the spiritual perspective is that God has gained the victory and we should live a life of victory, an abundant life, or if the demons have their way and they can speak into our soul, uh, then they can speak fear. They they can speak uh, uh, anxiousness, they can speak uh, defeatism and all of those negative emotions. But here's the irony is all of those negative emotions that are portrayed either from ourselves or others feed into the demonic strength that they have to then gain the victory. What, that, what does that mean? When the demons gain, gain the victory, it means that they can speak into our soul and cause depression. Uh, they can cause a uh, feeling that uh, I just want to get out of here. This world is going to, going to pot. And, you know, I, I just, everything is, is just caving in on me and I want to get out of here. <laughs> um, that feeds the demons then to speak into our soul. And I actually saw a literal outcome of what was happening in the two sides battling the angels and the demons with swords. These brilliant looking 
figures, gargantuan looking figures on the right side, the angels, in their um, their gallantly adorned uh, uh, outwear, which was a, a shields and a kind of, a, anyway, I, I describe it in my book, Heaven Stormed. If you wanna know exactly what it looked like, you can read Heaven Stormed. But on the other side, the demonic side, they were very decrepit looking, large, gargantuan also. And they were battling with these swords. And when the angel would fell, that is would uh, gain the victory over the demon, the demon would fall and kind of turn to a dust, not, not, not just evaporate into uh, nothingness, that demon that would be exiled in some way and manifested, whether it be in hell or some other place, or just banished from having any entree to a human being uh, in, in uh, the first heaven and, and our earth in this world. If the angel gained the victory, and what, how does the angel gain strength, strength? Well, the angels gain strength through the light of Jesus Christ, through the word of God, the truth, spoke uh, strength to the angels that would allow them to gain the victory. And also by prayer, when we pray, uh, when we give praise to the Lord, that gives strength to the angels to gain the victory over the demons. When we are encouraged, when we are uplifting, because we know whose God we serve, we serve the God of almighty God of righteousness, of victory, and of overwhelming, overpowering strength. When we declare that, when we feel it, that gives strength to the angels to gain the victory. You might even be feeling that right now as I've been talking about that as we give praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You are our victor. You are the one who will give us the victory. You are the one who will redeem all that is going on in our lives and in the world. You are the one, Lord Jesus Christ, as we give you all the praise and all the glory. How did that make you feel as you listening to that? It freed you up because the in the spiritual realm, the angels gained the victory. That is the Holy Spirit could speak hope, encouragement to you. And the demons were defeated because we declared that God is mighty to the pulling down of his strongholds. And we have already gained the victory through Christ. So back to what's going on today. 1 Thessalonians 5.11. Let's go there. It says, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in, the f in, the fact, as in fact you are doing. We have a lot of people within the Christian community, I have to say, and you probably experienced this before, who are very good at pointing out wrongs. Very good. That's not in and of itself a bad thing. We should be accountable. We should be accountable. However, we have very few encouragers within the body of Christ. You know who was a great encourager uh, in, in uh, the Bible? Barnabas. He was a great encourager. You don't hear much about him, but he was a great encourager. Paul encouraged Timothy uh, as Timothy was kind of his apprentice and building him up in the faith. But you know who else was very encouraging? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was a great, great encourager. He encouraged the woman who was caught in prostitution, Mary Magdalene, and about to be stoned. And he encouraged her by adopting her into his, his family as he walked on the earth. He encouraged Peter. He encouraged Peter to walk on water as the storm came upon and rocked the boat and he called Peter out to ride out the storm and walk on water with Jesus. But you know what happened, of course, and that is that Peter doubted Jesus and he started to sink after he initially started to walk on water. You see, there's a storm 
And I write about it in Heaven Storm. The storm is on its way. It's inevitable. We know about tribulation. We know the storm is is headed in our direction, but there are ways in which we can, through prayer and through our rejoicing and fellowship with one another, fend off some of the negative effects of that storm. But if the naysayers, the doomsday uh, prophets, if you will, if they are constantly pulling us down with what the enemy is going to gain the victory over, then what happens is that we succumb to the storm. Jesus was very calm in the storm. The storm would have no effect with Jesus, but he, Jesus, would allow us to rise above the storm to walk on water, that is to supersede the elements, to supersede the environment, to supersede the news, to supersede all of the evil in the world so that we can even supersede and gain the victory over the elements themselves as Jesus demonstrated in walking on water so that we can do miracles and we can do things of all kinds, which I witnessed, by the way in the storm. I witnessed the glory of God. I witnessed the miracles. And it was absolutely glorious. And it came through praise. And it came through encouragement. And it came through all of those things. And it came through the overcoming of fear. Because the phrase, fear not and do not be afraid, appears 365 times in the Bible. God gave us verses to overcome fear for every single day of the year. That's how important it is that we not be overcome by fear, that we will overcome fear through our strength in Jesus Christ. That's why fear is so destructive, why it it feeds, it fuels the enemies of God, which are the demons, Satan and his minions, because they feast on fear. But when we do those things which I mentioned to you, when we trust in Jesus, his first two words to me in heaven, when we trust the word of God, the promises of God, we overcome all of these trials. We overcome fear with victory. And that's what God desires for us. You know, in Deuteronomy 24, it says, for the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you the victory. First Corinthians 15, 57 says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. In Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And the, the doomsday sayers, the prophets who are saying that, that, that if, if somebody wins the election, then we're going to be in a, in a time where we're going to be oppressed and, and we're going to be, or or, or, or or prophets and, and a lot of good people. And I love these prophets and I, I love a lot of what they're doing, but some of them are falling into the trap of saying, you know, because all of this stuff is prophesied in the Bible or, or perhaps intended at some point in the maybe even distant future that they're saying the naysayers, the doomsday sayers uh, are saying that you should fear and, and that there's going to be a cataclysmic event and that you should cower because of the trials and the tribulations that are on their way. God never said that we should do that. He never called us to be succumbers to the evil in this world. He called us to be the victors in this world, to be the overcomers in this world. And I, you know, I live in California and, and this is a state which has uh, passed so many laws 
that are are creating so much darkness in the state. This is a beautiful state in California. I encourage you to join us at the Heaven Encounters Conference in San Diego. If you're watching this before the conference, September 12th through the 14th, you can register at randyk.org because you'll see how beautiful this state is. And that's just one part. San Diego is one of the most beautiful places in the country. And you can go to the mountains in Yosemite where Renee and I were married. You can go up the coast. You can go to to San Francisco, which sadly has succumbed to a lot of uh, of uh, these uh, kind of ridiculous laws. But it's a beautiful setting, perhaps the most beautiful setting for a city in the country. And yet I live in this place where I have seen a lot of these beautiful places be sullied by the darkness that has been imposed upon this beautiful state that God created. But you know what? I live here because God needs, God needs the light of Christ to shine in dark places. And so my fellow uh, believers and me who live here, we live not in, in desperation of what is happening in the state, but in victory that we declare for Jesus Christ to redeem this state to gain the victory over this state, to, to shine his light in places of darkness, to heal those and to gain, give wisdom to those who have operated for lack of wisdom. You see, demons feed off of fear. Angels feed off of faith. They feed off of trust in Christ. They feed off of the word of God. They feed off of praise. But you know, the angels really don't need faith as no one in heaven needs faith because once you're in heaven, you don't need faith to believe. You're there. You're face to face with Jesus Christ. You know, I I stand before you as one who had very little faith before my heaven experience, sadly, even as a Christian. But after my experience in heaven, I have, I have great faith because I have been face to face with Jesus. And you will, as a believer in Christ, be there. But you also, and we also, should have that experience. Maybe not that face to face as you will have in heaven. But the ex- experience with the Lord God Almighty on earth as it is in heaven. We should not be feel divorced from God at all. You know, the light of Christ, God's word, feeds the angels to gain the victory. But right now, today, sadly, many of the victories have been gained by the enemies of God. Why is that? It's because we have not been a victorious people. We have spoken the ugliness of the effect of those who have rejected God and the world that has largely rejected God, but we don't speak enough of the victory through the darkness. And that's why we have not been victorious in certain areas. We have not had those prayers that have been answered in a way that we see them in our public places and schools and and in other means in the government or whatever it happens to be. No, it is because prophecy, prophecy, beloved, has been distorted to, in some cases, demean and not redeem demean others, demean those who are at the effect of evil versus redeeming, redeeming that which has been lost through the truth and also through encouraging because prophecy should be encouraging. Let's talk about what prophecy is so that we clearly understand what prophecy is for this time, for this age, for this day. 
In its simplest form, prophecy is knowing God's will. It, it is understanding God's will. And prophecy can be foretelling, as it's spoken about in the Greek translation, or it can be truth-telling. But either way, it's knowing God's will and then speaking his truth into a person or a circumstance. It is the privilege, essentially, of delivering God's message. And, and, and many have thought it's prophecy is speaking uh, good and evil, which it is. But they extend that sometimes <laughs> to say that prophecy is putting down versus lifting up. And I'm all about accountability. And and I will call out, oftentimes, those who are operating in a spirit that is not of God. But we need to understand prophecy and what it truly is in New Testament prophecy that we have today, in the age of grace. In teaching about spiritual gifts, the Apostle Paul said that we should eagerly desire to operate in all the gifts, but especially the gift of prophecy. Because when we prophesy, it says in 1 Corinthians 14, 1 through 3, people are strengthened, encouraged, and comforted. That's what the Bible says. And if that's not happening in prophecy then we need to take a second look at prophecy. And again, I love, so I have so many friends who speak prophetically. And, and, I, and I believe in calling out evil in the world. I really do. I, I'm not uh, somebody who is a Pollyannish person. I've seen the evil. I've been at the effect of the evil. I get nasty letters. I get I get people who have threatened me. I've gotten all of that stuff because I'm in a field which, which, which hasn't been entirely accepted within the Christian community and certainly has been rejected outside of the Christian community because I'm talking about <laughs> I'm talking about Jesus being the God of heaven and the absence of Jesus in our lives. Uh, leading to hell. I speak a very, very strong message. And I receive very strong, strong criticisms that lead to condemnation even. So I know what that means. I know what that means. I've felt your pain if you've been abused uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a Christian organization or by somebody who's spoken uh, darkness into your life. I know, I, I've been there, done that. But you know what? If we're not, and I include myself, because sometimes I need to get a, a, a little disciplined uh, by the Lord as well. If we're not left on a note that, li- that gives encouragement, that that's not the end note, then then we need to really reevaluate whether we're speaking in love or we're speaking selfishly of our flesh. You know, the Old Testament prophets served as intermediaries between God and the Israelites. So understand that the Holy Spirit uh, was given by Jesus after his ascension, after he appeared 40 days and 40 nights, with the disciples, his followers and others uh, for those number of days. And then he said he needed to, uh, he needed to go back to heaven to send the Holy Spirit. And, and, and that was what happened on the day of Pentecost. So the Old Testament prophets did not have that. They did not have that same relationships where the Holy Spirit um, was abiding there was an external speak if you will through the prophets to the israelites uh, who acted essentially as god's mouthpiece Uh, you know isaiah who was a prophet in the old testament of course was uh, oftentimes called the messianic prophet he prophesied of uh, the messiah coming to uh, to earth jesus christ uh, and uh, 
Jesus himself and Paul, Peter and John requoted Isaiah's words in the New Testament. And early Christian communities saw the book of Isaiah as a prophetic picture of Jesus. So the Old Testament prophets operate in a very unique fashion that is not it was not uh, erased out in the New Testament, but was carried over. But the New Testament prophets have a little bit of a different calling. Their role is to confirm, to comfort, to exhort, and to edify, that is build up what Jesus is saying directly to a person through the Holy Spirit. So the prophet is to build up, to edify, You see, all of the gifts of the Holy Spirit are intended to edify, that is, build up. So if a prophet is leaving you feeling down, depressed, feeling uh, like you're you're just, uh, you know, kind of like giving up almost, that, that is not the gift of prophecy, New Testament gift of prophecy in action. That may be truth telling. It may be truth telling that, you know, this world is going to face eventually uh, tribulation and some feel that we're in it now. I'm not saying we are. I don't think so. I think when we get there, as I saw it in heaven and heaven storm, it, you're going to know it. Um, but and some are saying, you know, beam me up. You know, I want to be raptured right now. I want to escape. But, you know, even that escapism is denying our purpose for the here and now. We should be celebrating that we have in this very tight window, this very small window, in a nanosecond of eternity that we have been called to be here, to live on this earth for a very, very unique and very powerful purpose in this age and in this time. So we shouldn't be looking to escape. We should be looking in the moments that God has given us in our lives to serve him fully, and, and, and it is an honor to serve in dark places. It's an honor for me to be here in California and to serve him in this place to, to bring his light as, I, as people, you know, might have the opportunity to say, well, well you know, aren't you, isn't, you know, why don't you move to another state? No, you know, God called me here, but God called you there where you are. And maybe you're in a dark place. Maybe it's not the state you live in, but maybe it's, you know, uh, the places and situations that you have had to endure. But we should be giving praise that God has honored us, honored us with the opportunity to serve him in these places because this life is so short and heaven, eternity is so long that this is important work. This is a workstation. This is not it, beloved. This is not heaven. Uh, the, we've got work to do. We've got work to do. And when we share God's truth in love and not criticism, it frees people and defeats evil spirits that try to haunt us. You know, John 31 and 32 says to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You know, we should be feel, feeling free. We should not be feeling like we're shackled by the world and what's going on in the world or what's going on even in our lives. We have all gone through suffering. But you know what? The suffering is for a season and it is a very, 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 very short season. John sixteen thirty three says this, I have told you these things so that you, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. We need more compassion, not condemnation. No word should cause you to fear. We must be walking in boldness. That's what God's word says. The end chapter has already been written and we have the victory, we have the prize. And for those of you who don't have Jesus Christ, yes, you're probably feeling 
a lot of the condemnation. And maybe it's coming from a Christian and you feel condemned and you don't feel loved by by those in the Christian community. You feel like, you know, if you're going through whatever you're where you're going through, maybe it's you have feelings of, uh, you know, wanting to uh, of, of, of want, wanting to uh, use drugs pornography, uh, maybe you're feeling seduced, maybe you have a, an attraction, maybe you have an attraction toward uh, the same sex, maybe, maybe you have a lot of things going on in your life where, where you just are struggling, maybe you're living in, in what uh, has, has been called a life of sin, and it is truly a life of sin, but you know what? God is encouraging you to be set free. But it's going to take a relationship with Jesus Christ. You can't do it on your own. You're not happy. I know, I've never been happy. You know, when I was in my younger days and I drank too much or, you know, I did things that I shouldn't have done, I was, I was never really happy. It was, it was just a, an escape. You see, true joy is not happiness. Happiness is conditional, it's situational. Joy is a condition of the heart, and there's only one way you can get that. It's when you have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior giving you the power, the power to live the life that you know you want to live, you know is good, you know, not free of trouble, not free of trials, but the life that you truly want is the life of joy. And you'll have it to the fullest if you confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And if you haven't done that, do it right now, please. Do it right now. Surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ for what he did for you on the cross. To forgive you of your sins, that means you have to ask him for forgiveness. And you need to invite Jesus Christ to take the lordship over your life. Whatever that means, it's total surrender. I'm not saying that the Christian walk is easy. Sometimes it's not. But it's worth it. It is more than worth it. It is more than worth it. You're talking to a former agnostic. You're talking to a former doubter. You're talking to somebody who was formerly depressed. And it still goes through troubles, by the way. But I know who, the, who gives me the victor is you know who gives you the victor. Okay, finally, beloved of the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to encourage you to attend our Heaven Encounters Conference, as I think I already said. Uh, and you can continue to support our ministry uh, by going to randyk.org. These messages are uh, not, they're, they're uh, free of any charge to you, but they're not free of our producing them. That is, it costs us to, to do these uh, things, uh, and a very significant cost to that. Uh, it, it, it costs to, um, to produce my family, which is a virtual churches, small groups throughout the world, it costs to produce the Heaven Encounters Conference. It costs to um, develop the channel where we give uh, great, not just from myself, but other messages from other people as well. Um, and what I'm saying is that we, I thank you if you have partnered with our ministry. I thank you if you have registered for Heaven Encounters because I look so much to meeting you. I just thank you so much for um, for just being a prayer partner. That's, that's one of the most important things that I ask you for, is just to partner with us in prayer and support of, uh, of what, if you've, if you've benefited, if you've been uplifted, if you've been edified, um, if you've learned, drawn closer to Christ. Uh, no, it's not me. And it's not anything that we've developed. That's the spirit of Jesus Christ that has spoken to you personally through, yes, this vehicle that he has given for us to share with you. But 
you have joy not because of what we have done or anyone else. It's because of what the Holy Spirit has done within your life. You know, today you have freedom. You have freedom. And, and if you have spoken prophetically, as I have at times, where I put too much emphasis on on the negative that's in the world or the negative that is prophesied within the Bible, then just go back to that promise, all of the promises that I mentioned to you in this message, and knowing, knowing that we are not of this world. We are in this world, but we are not of this world. We are foreigners in this world. We are sojourners in this world. This is not home. This is not home. Heaven is your home, beloved, if you're in Christ. And if that's the case, case, I have some great news for you. And that is be of good cheer because heaven is in your future. Take care and God bless.